So let me welcome uh, Cindy Lee and Andrew Birch tonight. They have uh, just created um, a new magnificent book that I've been waiting for for about a year called uh, North American Flycatchers in Pidnex and Peewees. So this is, this is a, a very specific kind of field guide about a very difficult, um, kind of frightening uh, couple of, uh, a few birds. So a lot of people, just like a lot of people are afraid of gulls, a lot of people are afraid of flycatchers. But uh, I think they're both going to assure us that fear is not necessary and that you can, you can identify uh, many of the flycatchers, um, and we'll hear more about that. But Cinti and Andy have worked together for years on difficult identification. Um, I have a collection of their articles which I've saved on my drive, and I have uh, at least one on dowagers, one on loons, one on pipits, uh, another one on peewees, specifically on peewees. They've worked with the um, American Birding Association. They've also worked with surfbirds, which as far as I know is an online community um alone i don't know if they have a, a, a printed uh um, publication but magnificent detailed articles of some of the toughest identification challenges that north american birders have and i'm just so happy that you're both on this side of of the pond because otherwise you'd be dealing with philosophists old old world warblers and um we just don't have enough of those to make it worthwhile uh you've got arctic and willow apparently every once in a while but uh I'm so glad you're working on our North American uh, flycatchers. So with no further ado, I want to introduce Sin T and Andy and have them take it away. I'll, uh, you can go, I'll allow you to um, share your screen, and I'm doing that now for both of you. So you should both have the ability to share your screens whenever you're ready. Hey, that's... Let's see here. Um, do you see? Do you yes. see that? It's uh, not quite right. full screen. I don't know if you want to go full screen or not. But yeah. Uh, oh, let me go full screen here. Uh, here we go. You got the full screen now. Yes, uh, absolutely. Wonderful. And I'll move this out of the way here. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Thank you, Matthew, so much, and uh, Santa Clara Audubon Society for uh, having Andy and me here. And um, we're gonna split this talk up. Uh, I'll do the first half and do the second half, although we may interject here uh, and there, but um, yeah. So Flycatchers of North America, um, this is actually just volume one of a three-part series that's coming. And this first volume is focused on in Pitinax and Peewees. And there are these, uh, brown or dull green uh, birds that kind of give a lot of us headaches because they look so uh, similar. There hasn't been a field guide uh, presented for them uh, comprehensively yet, although there have been a number of articles and Andy and I uh, decided that it was time to kind of try to jump into this. We've been thinking about this and studying these things for decades. Um, but only until actually when COVID hit, did we decide to really move uh, faster um, on this and turn it into a book. Um, let me put a laser pointer here. So uh, thanks for introducing our, a little bit of our history. And Andy and I, we, we, uh, we actually come from your neck of the woods. We both were uh, Berkeley undergrads and that's where we first met. And uh, it was before the time of social media, so we probably thought we were the only birders in, on campus. And that's where we got started with an article on loons that Andy initiated. And then we went our separate ways to different parts of the country, and but we continued to work together and touched on uh, a lot of these challenging um, identification uh, problems, Orioles, Peewees, Dowagers, Pippets, and uh, I guess one of the things that somehow like Andy and I always um, were kind of on the same wavelength and especially on these difficult to ID birds was uh, a lot of it was about um, not focusing on your standard field marks. For example, like here are these egrets, um, 
you know, different colored bills, but more focusing on uh, structure uh, or proportions or color contrasts. Uh, and that was kind of trying to push the birding to a, a new kind of frontier. And really it's about gestalt uh, more than uh, individual uh, field marks. And I think a lot of beginning birders may feel intimidated by sort of gestalt uh, birding, but I, I, I put this up here. We, we know what these all are, cattle egret, snow egret, great egret, it's pretty obvious there. Um, but we already know, you can see that one, some of these have a much longer neck or longer legs or the bill structures are, are different. A cattle egret has a thicker, shorter neck. And you, so you already can see this and the human eye, you don't have to be an expert birder, advanced birder, you already can see this. My eight-year-old kid can see that these are different, for example. So um, it's something innate that we uh, really have already. And by going into flycatchers, um, it's really just honing those sorts of skills and coming up with a common language that we can uh, talk to each other when we're comparing our identifications. And of course, one can graduate up to a slightly higher level uh, looking at shorebirds. And uh, a lot of times we, we get frustrated with shorebirds because there's so many plumages, different ages, breeding, winter plumage, but really most of the uh, season birders are, are identifying shorebirds based on structure, length of bill, shape of bill, body shape, all of that. And so here is just some, we don't need to worry about who, what species they are, but uh, you can obviously see that, that they're all, they're all different. So uh, this presentation really is about holistic birding and it's focused on in Pitanax, but hopefully, and that kind of was our goal, uh, Andy and me, was that by going through this book, uh, you come out with, um, uh, you know, being a better birder in general, not just at flycatchers, but looking at birds in a different way. And so we kind of think about this as a, a holistic type of birding where, uh, of course, you focus on traditional uh, field guides, uh, field marks, but you also look at shapes and proportions, contrast, you bring in voice or vocalizations, habitat, behavior, seasonal status and, and so forth. So getting to our book, uh, they're, you know, flycatchers, they are, I think, one of the largest families of birds in the world, certainly in the new world, they're the, they're the largest, there's 400 species in there and uh, across the tropics, South America, all the way to uh, where we are here. And we're not gonna cover all of them, but uh, in North America, we have, uh, these neotropical migrants or migrants coming from Central America. And uh, there's still a good group there. And one of them is these Pitanax and Peewees here. And this is just showing you the, the birds and how they're related to each other genetically. But these are the ones that we um, uh, deal with in our uh, book. And um, so Peewees and Pitanax. We threw in tufted flycatcher, which is not really related to the, uh, the contopus and pinnax, but superficially looks similar. So it kind of made sense to stick that in. And let me, let me show you a few photos of flycatchers to get us started here. And uh, here you see, uh, it's not, again, not important to, uh, to worry about the name, the specific identification. Just want to show you uh, these different photos here. And, of course, the first thing you probably notice are they, they have slightly different colors, kind of a, a bright buffy on the right. Um, you've got a grayish one in the middle, and then on the left, one that's a little bit more contrast, even greenish uh, color on the, on the back. And uh, we're all visual, well, most of us are visual people, and we're tuned into colors. Um, certainly traditional field marks are a lot about colors and color patterns, but the, the reality is when you look at flycatchers, and they purposely gray tone this, is that either the lighting is not uh, appropriate, uh, the bird is uh, flying by quickly, and you never get a great look. Um, and, and on top of that, your, uh, each one of our eyes perceives color in a different way. So one person's 
light green might be a, uh, an olive tone or even the brown to somebody else's eyes. And it makes it very difficult to compare uh, and notes. So this is kind of extreme, but often what you end up seeing is that all these muted colors and the same flycatcher can appear to be like a chameleon. It looks green uh, underneath the leaf. And then when it gets out in the sun, it looks gray. So uh, color is really something we try to, we, we have it in the uh, field guide, but we just sort of de-emphasize that relative to other uh, features. And so when you look at these uh, flycatchers, um, some of the features, just a hint of what's to come, is to look at proportions. And here you have uh, uh, the, the short one right here showing you the primary uh, extension, and this is the the tail, the length of the tail, and sort of the ratio of these two um, is different between these uh, species. That can give you a hint of, of uh, the identification if you can quantify it, if you can see that in the field. Other things are you know, the relative plumage contrast, color contrast, rather than focusing on con uh, color itself, but looking at relative color difference between the chest and the back. Right here, this is low contrast, strong contrast on the left. Um, wing bar contrast, for example, and, and so forth. So the book, and I guess this talk is a little bit of a teaser of what's in the book or, or how to use the book. Um, the first part of the book is really about how to look and listen to a bird, to flycatchers, and develop a common language. And that first part, it's a really important part. The goal there is not to put an idea on a bird, but is to kind of tell you what to look for. When you see a flycatcher, um, where do you start? Uh, what are the things to internalize? Or when you're looking at a photograph, what do you focus on uh, there? And so we put it together um, in these sort of charts here. The left is a kind of qualitative similarity chart showing you what species are probably more likely to be confused with each other. For example, uh, you know, western and eastern wood peewees are, are together and they're both close to the willow flycatcher, whereas gray flycatcher is sort of out here on its own and unlikely to be confused with uh, willow in general. Uh, so you can kind of look, you know, yellow-bellied and western flycatcher and then Hammonds and Dusky, for example, out in California, that's where this, this trio here is the part that, uh, you know, you'll see most often and be challenged with. And then we have on here what's a scorecard, and I'm not going to dwell on this much, but it just have, has these different features. And what you can do is you can score it. And one of the things about flycatchers is there is no sort of um, silver bullet uh, field mark, um, that single field mark that works for all. And if you relied on that, you will probably end up misidentifying them. In fact, what you have to use is all of things together, multiple field marks. And on top of that, any particular feature has some variability and there's overlap between uh, each species. For example, primary projection, which we'll get back into in a second, um, overlaps between two species. Um, and it may seem like you can't identify them, but when you put that whole combination together uh, as a whole, everything, uh, it actually, there is a unique um, combination, but individual ones are not unique. Uh, the combination is. So uh, the first part of the book is about training your eyes to see some of these features. And Andy's uh, illustrations, of course, here are, are absolutely crucial. Um, you know, getting these right is one of the most difficult things, even for um, seasoned artists. So uh, and I, I think Andy's one of the few that can get these uh, right and still make them look uh, attractive and, and pretty. And so uh, they're, they're very accurate in here. Um, so I'll go through first some of the more traditional ones that you hear about when identifying flycatchers. And one is uh, the bill length or, or shape. There's long ones like gray flycatcher and short ones like Hammond's flycatcher out in California. And then you have intermediate ones, which would be willow, uh, alder and sort of dusky and Pacific slope uh, flycatchers. And what you do if you want to use that scorecard, you would uh, look at the bird and compare it. You hold the book open and compare it to these uh, diagrams here, and then you choose. And you can either choose if it's 
If you're not sure if it's long or medium, you can pick both. Uh, generally, it's not you're not going to have any trouble. You're not going to pick all three. You're going to either pick in this uh, spectrum or or this spectrum, long to medium or medium to small. And here's some photos to illustrate some of these differences. Here's here's a gray flycatcher, and here's a Hammond's a shorter, more stubbier uh, bill. Another one that is talked about a lot uh, already is um, the lower mandible color and the eye ring. And uh, again, there is overlap, uh, but in general, something like a Hammonds will have a darker lower mandible than when you go to a gray flycatcher, which is uh, lower mandible is mostly entirely orange with maybe a slightly uh, dusky tip. Now you have to be careful because lighting conditions, they all have sort of duskiness in here or a little bit of paleness to the bill. So sometimes it's very hard to see these differences if the lighting conditions are not, not good. When in doubt, take a, take a lot of pictures, of course. Um, in an eye ring, uh, in the extremes, like your Western flycatchers, the teardrop shape, that's usually pretty diagnostic. And then you have another extreme where the eye ring is almost uh, non-existent. And then, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of flycatchers where the eye rings are all kind of similar. Uh, it's, it's present, and it's not alone a great uh, field mark, but at the extremes, it can be useful. Now I'm going to move into one, some of the marks that are a little less um, uh, popular or uh, traditional. Or, uh, I mean, crown shape, of course, is one that we tend to be familiar with uh, out in California. You have the peak to uh, or crest, the crest of the Pacific Slope, and then that grays to somewhere where you have a peak, not so much a crest, all the way down to a flat crown, like gray flycatcher or these rounded uh, crowns. Again, none of these are unique by themselves, but you can see that there are groups of birds that tend to have rounded heads, uh, groups of birds that tend to have uh, a peak or a crest to the, the head. And so while looking at the crown, it's also worth looking at the forehead right here. And we call this the forehead angle. Again, a lot of overlap, but you can take the extremes, say something like a Hammonds tends to have a fairly steep forehead. And then you go to Acadian uh, or Gray, uh, they have a very shallow forehead. In the case of Gray, it's, it's sort of accentuated here with the flat, uh, flat head there. And tail length, this uh, is important to, to use this uh, scoring here. Uh, one person's, you know, all flycatchers have long tails compared to other birds. But uh, so you have to think about um, uh, proportions here. And you know, some person's long tail could be someone else's short tail. So terminology matters. And uh, you know, here you look at the two together and uh, or the three here and talk about whether the tail looks like this, which would be long here to the uh, proportionately short relative uh, to the bird. And with the tail, uh, always uh, pay close attention to the, the structure of the wings, and in particular, how much the primaries, which are the outer wing feathers, stick beyond the um, inner wing feathers, which would be the secondaries, and this would be the tertials up here but how far do they extend beyond the tertial stack? And it's sort of this ratio from the lower wing bar to the tertials, and then the extension beyond the tertials here that uh, we're trying to uh, clue you into. And so some birds have a short primary extension, see like this gray. Look how long the tertials and secondaries are that stack compared to the projection of this, the primaries. And you compare that to um, a least right here, which is a bit longer, uh, and then a Cadian, which is really long, and then uh, something like a Hammonds would be uh, somewhere between least and a Cadian, so uh, uh, also long, but not as long as the Cadian right here. So those are some things that uh, both Andy and I believe you, you can actually see it. Um, you don't actually have to take a ruler out into the field or even a ruler uh, if you have a photograph. Um, when you get practice seeing a lot of these, going through a book, you, you hopefully will develop a, a more intuitive feel 
of these structural differences when you, you go out there. Um, so I, I'm turning now to more uh, color contrasts. I don't want to focus on color itself, but more uh, the contrasts. And uh, uh, we already know a lot about that some flycatchers have bolder wing bars and some have sort of duller wing bars. But I think it, when you say dull or you say bright, you have to uh, put it in the context of some reference. And often it's good to compare the wing bar color to the back color and how much does it stand out to the back. Um, so here, this would be a weak. And here you can see it, it's pretty strong. It's in least or yellow belly flycatcher. You can see through here, compare the wing bar to the back. Um, and that's how I would quantify uh, or, or qualify a uh, wing bar contrast because all these flycatchers essentially have wing bars. And relative, related to that is the contrast between the under parts and the upper parts. And you can look at the chest and then look at the nape or the face and uh, see if they are uh, uh, contrasting or not. Like in Hammonds, there's very little contrast. And often that's almost pretty, one of the best ways to separate if you ever get like a, a vagrant Hammonds on the East Coast or a vagrant least flycatcher on the West Coast. Well, the least has a very white chest and white throat compared to the, the face and very different, much more contrasty than, than a Hammonds uh, flycatcher. Again, you got to compare uh, two parts of the body, not just uh, look at the color of one particular spot. And so here you can see uh, the, the Hammonds. I mean, look at the chest and the back here. It's the same color almost. And then go all the way to some of the Eastern birds. Most of the Eastern birds have strong contrast. And the Western flycatch, the Western uh, birds tend to have low contrast between back and uh, front. See? So east, that's generally a good rule of thumb. Eastern birds show contrast, Western birds don't as much. And then uh, finally, the, well, tail width, um, it's also, it's a structural thing. This is something that isn't talked about uh, that much. Um, it, you know, we normally focus on the length of the tail, but the, the width of the tail can be uh, a sign. And so we, consider uh, there's a narrow tails or wide tails. Narrow tails often even narrow towards the body. You can see like this Hammonds right here as a narrow tail uh, thinning down towards the body. And then you go to willow and alder flycatchers, they kind of have a straighter and wider, even proportionally uh, kind of uh, feels like a stiff, I guess, tail here. Uh, whereas this one looks like you can kind of twist it off just like that. And so those are subtle, but if you can get tuned your eyes to that, it's, a, it's a, often a good hint. And um, wing panel contrast, the, this turns out to be quite good for separating some species, um, although you can see a lot of species fall in the same category of weak uh, wing panel contrast, but uh, a lot of the Eastern birds have strong wing, wing panel contrast, Western birds have and the weak wing panel contrast. And by wing panel, we're talking about this secondary stack, which has all these pale edges to the feathers. And then the primaries right here, the primary stack, the longer ones, the outer wing, um, they can have also pale edges, not as strong as the secondaries, but they can be a little bit pale, as you see here, to where there are no pale edges, and it almost looks like the the this panel down here is black over here. And you can see it here, look at the least, how dark it is, the primaries. And then at the other extreme, the gray flycatcher uh, has these pale edges in the primaries and the secondaries all together. So there's no contrast between the two panels and strong over here. Uh, another thing to watch for is behavior. Um, I mean, all flycatchers, Almost all of them tend to, they flick their wings, they flick their tails. Uh, so it's not usually diagnostic, but at the extreme, say something like um, this uh, gray flycatcher, it dips its tail downward there. And that's quite diagnostic of a gray, but you gotta be careful because 
uh, to know what a tail dip is because other flycatchers like this, when they flick their tail, it looks like it's also dipping its tail, but if you look carefully, it lifts the tail up first and then takes it down. So it's up and then down, whereas gray just drops it down and then brings it back up. Vocalizations uh, are absolutely crucial. Um, sometimes you may not get the best photo. Uh, we've seen a number of cases where uh, many experts have come in and trying to identify a bird based on um, the photographs. And at the end of the day, it turns out we're all wrong when the bird finally uh, calls. And Andy did these uh, vocalizations here. And this, this is called a spectrogram where you have frequency on the y-axis and time here. And it sounds a bit technical or looks a bit technical, but they're pretty simple to use. And if you go up high, this is high frequency, low frequency here. And we just, uh, describe here uh, how to uh, talk about different types of calls, like a whit is rising like that. If it's really narrow, it'd be a hard, sharp whit. If it curves up like this, peaks like that, it's more like a pip. And then you have a slur, a pip like a Hammond's flycatcher, or a slur like a Western flycatcher. And then you have bur different types of burry notes here, which, which have a lot of notes uh, in a very rapid, rapid succession there. Um, and so, while our book doesn't actually give you the audio, it gives you these spectrograms, which you can then go to, say, uh, Xenocanto or Macaulay, the eBird databases. And these are really meant for to help you visualize, since most of us are visual creatures, visualize the calls. And then that helps you internalize and remember uh, the calls a little better. Yeah, I think, we, uh, can I yeah. chime in? Since, yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Visualization, it looks very technical. Um, but, you know, everybody who has a smartphone these days, if you've got the Merlin app, you can actually record live, it actually shows you the spectrogram, you can actually visualize the shape of the sound as you're watching the bird, um, or you just simply can record it, and, and if you upload it to eBird, or you upload it to this other website, Xenocanto, they can create spectrograms for you. If you're really keen, which a lot of people do, that there is free software. There's something called Audacity that you can download and you can have that on your laptop and you can bring these recordings in and you can really analyze them quite closely. Um, and, it, and it will certainly show you the difference between whether you were recording a pip or a wit. And, and that is something where sometimes our language has been confused and one person's wit is another person's pip, but it would actually show you definitively on the spectrogram what the call was. Um, and, and as you become more advanced with these flycatchers, you know, uh, you know, we feel like it's actually possible to separate the wit of a dusky from the wit of a gray from the wit of a least and that um, you, you can actually see visual differences, even though maybe our ears aren't attuned to pick up the differences, you can actually see the visual differences between these birds. That's right, yeah, thanks, Sandy. And uh, the good thing about flycatchers is most of their frequencies are down in the audible range. As we get older, we lose up, way up here, but most of us should be able to hear, but this should help us visualize uh, the fine differences uh, there. Um, and so, back, you know, back to this holistic birding, you, you know, you look at all these visual features, audio features, but you, you should also zoom out and look around, look at the surroundings, look at where this flycatcher is, the type of habitats, you know, sort of large scale habitats, all the way down to the micro habitats. Is it in, in the shade or is it out in the open? Um, and here, these are actually all from the West. Uh, in the breeding areas, is it a really shady environment with these sycamores here, like a Pacific Slope, or are we talking up in the, uh, the forests, the high alpine forests, where Hammonds would be, or Ponderosa Pines, where you might have more uh, dusky flycatcher, or sagebrush areas with pinions, where gray flycatcher might be in there. And those all can help clue you in to the type of bird that you're, you're looking at. And then um, finally, before I hand it off to Andy, the um, we have all these maps in here, and uh, these maps are something that you know we really could not have done 20 years ago. And essentially, we brought in a lot of information from eBird, and all of your contributions are in there. Uh, citizen science 
And just the enormous amount of data is really allowing us to um, tell the story of when these birds uh, arrive and um, their distributions. And these maps have these contour uh, lines here to tell you, you know, what does when when do they in first week of April when they're coming up? Where are they going to be? So uh, or May or something like that. And then these bar charts tell you when they arrive. And uh, sometimes this can be very useful. The I have uh, the peewees on the left, or western wood peewee, and then I got uh, willow flycatcher on the right over here. And you know, willow and western wood peewee can often be misidentified, but Willows usually come in May. Uh, it's hard, you, you probably won't find one in April, uh, except at the very end of April. Whereas if you're out there in mid-April and you see something that looks like a willow, chances are it's a, a peewee. And that's not just out here in California, um, but uh, certainly down in Texas, the willows and alders come very late uh, after May actually, and after the May 1st. So I think um, I'll, Turn it over to you, Andy. This is the uh, kind of the species account. Thank you. Yeah, just to, just to reiterate on those maps, in the spring, obviously it's a little, a little more fluid in the fall, but in the spring, this could probably be your best aid in on many species. And you almost, I, you know, you almost sort of say, I, I don't care what the plumage looks like. It could be red, white, and blue. If, if you are unsure whether you're looking at a, a willow flycatcher or a western peewee and it, the date is now, uh, you know, mid-April, um, you know, willow flycatcher is amazingly faithful um, to the dates that it arrives. Um, and these dotted lines here represent each week of the month. So, you, you, you know, not just for, for these species, but others, you can sort of look at where you are and, and sort of see, okay, we're third week of April, is this really likely for this species to be here? And presumably if you enter your bird into eBird, it will get flagged as rare and maybe this will give you a chance. You can then look at the map and go, okay, I understand why it's rare. It's two weeks early or one week early. Um, and so if you're on the fence about the ID, it, it may be enough to actually swing it for you. And so these maps are actually as important in some cases as the actual illustrations. All right, let's have a look at some birds we've, we're focusing on the ones you're likely to see out here so we've got the wood peewees I'm just going to move this screen here um, so I think the first thing to notice about these birds are those long primaries those sort of sword-like primaries that stick way out on the bird unlike any empidonax the closest might be a Hammond's flycatcher um, but look how plain the face is. There's very little eye ring there. Um, it's somewhat crested. They're quite dark brown, um, quite a lot of high contrast. It, and really, in many ways, they're unlike any Empidonax, both in plumage and structure. Um, and what do we what have we got here, Cindy? Western and Eastern, I assume. Is yeah, that right? Western, Western and Eastern. You know, you don't need to worry about eastern wood peewee, but if you're one of the more advanced birders on, on here tonight, you might be looking out for one of these in the fall. They have a different call. They tend to have a slightly paler, on average, their mandible, lower mandible is a paler, you know, orange color, you know, yellowish color. Um, but uh, in general, for, for the average birder, you're not really considering or thinking about eastern wood peewee. You're thinking about western wood peewee which is obviously well-known and, and common, particularly at this time of year, you, you'll see quite a few coming through. On the next slide. So um, here's some of the sort of confusion species. Again, with a Western slant, we have a Hutton's Vireo in here, which is actually um, quite often confused for a flycatcher and Empidonax because it's got this teardrop like eye ring it's got these wing bars it's fairly olive colored they're a little more substantial than a kinglet so they seem a little bit bigger um, and can often be confused and and certainly you, you know you can often find some uh hutton's vireos in the in the ebird library that are, are labeled as pacific slope so it's certainly a bird to be aware of i think one of the things that sort of stands out is you, you know posture 
uh, flycatchers. We have a willow flycatcher to the left there. It's more of an upright posture. Hutton's Vireo is moving around more like a warbler, perhaps, uh, whereas a flycatcher will tend to sit still and sit more upright. Um, and then we have the, 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 the peewees. We have olive-sided flycatcher and western wood peewee. In the middle here, you've got that uh, diagram that just shows you, emphasizes the long primary projection of wood peewees compared to the average impidinax. And that's often a great clue if you, if you get close to one. Often, um, often, often, um, uh, you know, wood peewees and, and, and olive ciders, they, they sit right up in the open on top of tall trees. Um, you know, that's often quite a good clue for them. When I'm looking for them in the spring, I'll find olive ciders sitting right on the top of a, of a, of a bare snag, uh, and sometimes wood peewees are there. Uh, very similar, as you can see, these pictures from below show you two very similar looking birds. The olive sided tends to have a more streaky chest. And it's a little more open up to the, the throat. It's less, I guess, less buttoned up. It's often a more open sort of chest um, and, and more streaky. It's a bigger build bird. Um, both of them will often show some sort of streakiness on the undertail coverts, which is quite a, a useful feature if you're unsure if you're looking at a, a wood peewee or a willow flycatcher. You know, both of them have a similar sort of bland sort of face without too much of an eye ring. But sometimes, you know, when someone sends me a photo of the two and the, the lighting's not great, you can't quite tell the color on it. If I detect some streaking on the undertail coverts, that usually helps sway me in that uh, in that regard. And then the only other thing to note about olive sided is um, this back posture here. You know, sometimes they'll show these two white tufts. Um, you, you know, often in the spring, you, you can sometimes see birds, certainly on the breeding grounds, they'll, they'll show these sort of quite obvious white tufts on the back. Sometimes hard to see because I must admit my view of an olive sided is usually from below. But, um, you, you know, you can sometimes see them at eye level and, and you might be you might have your attention drawn to that. Let's go on to the next one. So here's some, um, we're, we're just looking at speed. We're not going, no one needs to worry. We're not going to look at a Cajun flycatcher and all this sort of stuff. You're never, never going to see out here. We're just going to focus on the, on the California birds. So uh, willow flycatcher, let's sort of put some of these, uh, you know, Sinti sort of built the language for what we should use. And it's very important that we all use or try to use the same language because obviously one person could say that, you know, the primary projection is long and the tail is short and another person could feel like it's a medium length or a long length. So it's important that we have that language, which is what Cinti was setting up earlier. So let's sort of put this into practice here. There's a couple of willow flycatchers. I think just off the bat, before we look at anything, we can sort of see a fairly plain face, not a very distinct eye ring. That's, that's very uh, you know, typical of willow um, and, and really is, only shared by um, a, you know a peewee, an olive sided or, or or a wood peewee. But look at those primaries; they're quite sort of short in comparison to the to the wood peewees. So you know we we would call that, or we're calling that, a medium primary extension. Notice the shape of the forehead; we're calling it shallow. It's a bit peaked at the back. The crown is quite peaked. I've always mentioned the eye ring. There's a sort of medium contrasty throat, it's a bit of a white throat on that bird on the left, sort of contrasting with the cheeks a little bit. Its bill is not tiny, it's not particularly long, it's sort of a medium, sort of largish bill. It's maybe a little hard to see in these photos, but you know, you know, it looks like it could have a sort of fairly sort of fattish tail. The tail's not particularly long either, it's probably sort of medium to short. And those wing bars are quite dull, I wouldn't describe that as a particularly bright wing bars. I wouldn't describe it as having a particularly strong wing panel contrast. Um, and then also importantly, it's got a very orange lower mandible. Um, and then, you know, if we put all these pieces together, we can kind of rule some species out and we narrow in on, on, uh, on willow. Um, and, and, you know, as is mentioned here, you know, in the spring, very faithful to arrival dates. So if it's not May 1st yet, and you think you have a willow, Make sure you photograph it well, and and um, uh, you, you know you you may well have an early willow, but it's also a very good chance it might actually be a wood peewee. 
Let's go on to the next one. So here's a here's just some illustrations of that. Uh, you know, we talk about the wide tail, fairly dull, thin eye ring, um, fairly sort of similar to the wood peewee. And then on the on these maps here, you can clearly see it's a bird that occurs in most of North America from May onwards. Um, and if we look at California, Southern California, Eastern California, you know, that gives you the sort of the peak times is actually sort of mid to mid May onwards is when you you see most of them. Um, I know here in in Los Angeles, you know, I'm looking out for them from the beginning of May, but I often don't see one until the first or second week. And we have Pacific Slope Cordillera. So this is the one probably everyone's most familiar with. That's the one that you probably get in your backyard on occasion. It's the one you probably see most frequently. We, we have this slash here, Pacific Slope Cordillera, and it used to be called Western Flycatcher. Then it got split into two species with Cordillerian uh, occupying most of the eastern part of the range. Um, you know, Cynthia and I are not professional ornithologists, so we're not going to weigh into the debate about whether it should have been split to begin with. But just so you are aware, there's a lot of debate amongst birders probably from the day it was split about whether it should have actually been split and whether it should, uh, Pacific Slope Cordillera should, should remain one species. Um, I think part of the problem is they are indistinguishable in the field. Um, I think there are you know, some subtle differences perhaps. Um, and call has generally been the, the, you know, the male position note call has generally been the way that, uh, you know, people have separated these two. Um, but it appears as there's been more and more studies by, by birders in the field that there are lots of birds giving intermediate calls in, in ranges of overlap. And, and, you know, I think there's probably a lot of questions still to be answered and I think there are papers on the way that will presumably answer those as whether these are hybrids or whether uh, whether there's just a general climb and and um, calls change as you go through the range but um, you know along the bottom here we have sort of an example of a being a very typic typical pacific slope call that you would hear uh, out where you are um, and as you move across the, you know, move east and you move into parts of eastern Washington and Alberta and Montana, you have birds that are calling in a more inter intermediate type range till you get all the way over to M, um, which I think is, you know, southeast Arizona, which is the core part of, core part of the range, you know, where you have a very classic Cordillera and call, which is this sort of, it's got a break in the middle, it's like a two part call. Um, but there does seem to be some variation as you go across the range. Um, but this bird, you, you, you know, you, you probably are familiar with it. it it's quite distinctive. It's, it's really in California. It's the only sort of basically yellow green bird. Um, you know, it's fairly yellow greenish above. It's fairly yellowish below. It has this teardrop eye ring. Um, it has um, it, a, quite a pale base to the bill you know often the bill is quite pale based all the way to the tip um the, the wing bars wing panels all fairly low contrast it's not not a high contrast bird um and has this obviously distinctive call and this is the empid that you will probably is your default empid and axe out here both in the spring and the fall um and, it, and it's good to get familiar with them look at look at them when you see them as, as you get more used to them it will help you pick out the, the Hammonds or the gray or even the Dusky if you happen to come across one. Here's a few illustrations just for showing you the, the variation. You can get quite dull birds. That photograph we saw is actually a pretty dull bird, probably a, a young bird. Uh, the young birds often in the fall have quite buffy wing bars. Um, some of these birds can be very, very dull indeed um, and can be a bit of a pitfall, you know, particularly in the fall if you come across one where you just feel like it's devoid of color. It can be a little bit disarming um, but again generally you're looking for you know teardrop eye ring and sort of low contrast on the wings and the wing bars and often structurally they have this rather peaked almost sort of crested head um, you know they obviously head shape changes with mood and posture but I, I rarely see a, a pacific slope that doesn't show me its true head shape after watching it for a while 
And here we have the, uh, we just go back, we just have the sort of the maps and, and the range maps. This is a species that you may actually also find in winter from time to time. I occasionally find it in my local area in Southern California. It's rare, but it does, it does also occur. I mean, in fact, other than willow flycatcher, I think probably all the ones we talk about this evening and Western wood peewee, um, you, you know, uh, apart from peewees and willow flycatcher, I think all the empids we talk about this evening actually, you know, can occasionally occur in the winter in, in, in our area. Gray flycatcher. This is actually one that you might, certainly in Southern California, we encounter it in the winter. I don't know up uh, up in, in your area whether you encounter it so much. I think you do. Um, but um, this is actually quite, it's a very subtle bird, but also quite distinctive. Um, as you can see, looking at that photo, there really isn't much to go on. It's basically a gray bird with some pretty nondescript wing bars. But this is where structure really helps on a bird like this. I mean, if we look on the left here, we can sort of see, you know, basically dull gray chest, dull gray all over, weak wing panel contrast, not a lot to go on. But on, on a gray, I really focus on structure. They have this quite long bill. Um, it, it, it's not all of them show such an obviously long bill, but most of them do. Quite a long sort of flat bill. Often the lower mandible is quite brightly colored, you know, a bit like a Pacific slope, but it is a different shape to the bill. It doesn't have a teardrop eye ring like a Pacific slope would, um, and very little color on it at all. It's, it's quite devoid of color. And it's got quite a thin, long tail. And then as Cynthia showed in his video, they have this, um, you know, very helpful habit, which is useful if you study them a lot and get used to, uh, uh, you know, how you would describe it. But they have this helpful habit of sitting out in the open, sitting on a fence, sitting on trees, on bare branches, sort of at eye level. And they sort of pump their tail downwards in a very deliberate manner. Um, and it does take some practice to, because obviously they have to bring it up before they bring it down. It's like, is it pumping its tail down or is it bring it up? And it does take some practice. Um, but you but you will get used to this habit that experienced birders tend to talk about as as dipping the tail downwards. Um, and they do that and they'll often call at the same time. They give this wit call. You know, it's a very soft wit call. Um, Pacific Slope does not give a, a wit call. Um, wood peewees do not give wit calls. Willow flycatcher does. Um, it's one of, it's one of uh, there's a few of these birds that we can look at today that gives a wit call. But gray flycatcher is one of them that does. Here's some illustrations of it. Again, it's sort of pointing out that orange lower mandible. Um, quite, quite a distinctive head state. If you look at that sort of sketch in the bottom left hand, that's sort of a, a, a quick sort of summary if you don't get a good view of it and it's in silhouette, et cetera. If you're looking at sort of a fairly longish build bird with this sort of, you know, flat round, sometimes people describe it as a dome shaped head um that that is different subtly different from some of the other flycatchers and also has this sort of fairly um long thin tail and the, and the primaries are not particularly long they're fairly short um on the map over here on the left you can sort of see that it, it is a bird that you know will sometimes winter you know along california it's certainly not an uncommon winter in uh, in south uh, eastern california arizona etc um, and then for, for the rest of California, it's on the move in April and probably is showing up uh, where you are now. I'm sure you, you have gray flycatchers coming through. Hammonds. This is another bird that I think you will see quite a bit of in the spring from time to time. Um, I think just first things when you see this picture, look at that tiny small bill. People often refer to sort of Hammonds as reminding them of a kinglet. Um, and they are actually not too dissimilar in some regards, just looking at them structurally, quite a small, dark bill. They do have an eye ring. Um, sometimes, you know, it's described, I think, in our book as messy. Sometimes it can look a little teardropped. You know, you can see it's a bit expanded at the back of the head there. So maybe that might re remind you of a Pacific Slope. Um, but certainly very dull bird in compared to Pacific Slope, you know, in terms of the crown and the breast is fairly gray. Um, but those wing bars, you can actually see they look really quite bold. It's quite a, it's quite a decent wing bar contrast. Um, 
What you can't see well here, but we will in the pictures when we go on to the next slide, is it have the very long primary projection and a short tail. You see this sort of short tail, it's often forked. I wouldn't rely on the fork alone, but often birds show this quite forked tail and, and the tail is quite short relative to these very long primaries. And I think, you know, if you, if there's, there's very few birds in this family in California that would look like that in primaries. And I think it's the peewees. Um, and, and I think, you know, as you compare it to the Western wood peewee, you'll see there's quite a few differences. And the other very distinctive thing, particularly in the spring, I, you know, I went out at lunchtime today and I had a Hammond's is, is they will often call quite a bit and they have a pip call. So unlike the wit of a gray or a dusky, they have this pip call. Um, and if you're worried about, well, how will I tell the difference between a pip and a wit? Get your phone out, you know, go to Merlin and hit record, record the file. Um, and you'll actually see the shape of it. It's this sort of inverted V, it's sort of upside down V here. Um, that That is, is the pip shape. Uh, versus the wit, which is more of a of a straight line. And they can sometimes be quite vocal birds, particularly on the spring, they're, they're calling sometimes as they're feeding, just like greys do as well. So this is uh, maybe a better sort of view of that species. Look again at those long primaries and a fairly short tail in relation. It's got quite a boldish sort of eye ring, bolder than a dusky, and it's maybe a little bit teardropped. We kind of describe it as messy. It's a variable looking eye ring. It's not quite as consistent as a Pacific slope, but uh, you know, it is a variable looking eye ring. And that small bill, which is often quite dark, there's often not a lot of color on it. It's not always, like Cynthia said at the beginning, there's no diagnostic feature with these birds. And I've certainly seen Hammonds with quite pale lower mandibles, but uh, they often tend to show quite dark um, lower mandibles. And then, you know, a, a sort of varying range of sort of wing bar contrast, but in general, they tend to be quite contrasty birds on, on the wing. Um, if we were to look at the range maps here on the right, and you'll see that they're on the move in California now, you wouldn't typically be seeing one before April. Uh, but now they're on the move. First, second week of April is 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 when you you start seeing them, which is right about now. Occasionally, we get a few of those that winter in Southern California. I think you might get the odd one that winters in Northern California as well, but uncommon to to rare. Sorry, we can go on to dusky. So this is a bird that wits, unlike the Hammond that pips. Very similar to Hammonds. Um, dusky flycatcher, you may feel like it's not too dissimilar to gray as well. Look at this bird, very dull overall, very uh, low contrast between the wing bars and the back, weak wing panel contrast. The primary projection is maybe a little hard to see on this bird, it looks a bit of a mess back there. <laughs> but I, you know, I think we would describe that as a sort of medium. Uh, you know, primary projection on this particular bird. It doesn't look particularly short, but I, I would say it's sort of in that medium range. I think shorter than you would see on a, on the average Hammonds. And then the tail is not particularly short. I think on the Hammonds, you'd expect the tail to be, you know, a little bit shorter if we had it in profile. Yeah, probably sort of where Cinti's sort of marking it out. So it's a little bit longer. And a gray would even be longer still. Um, and then if we're lucky to hear it calling, it's it's got a wit call, which also helps, you know, because that narrows it down to willow flycatcher or, or gray flycatcher, you know, assuming it's, assuming we're not tempted to think we have a least. Let's move on. Here's, here's a uh, sort of side profile, just showing some of the things we talked about. Look again, structurally, look at that shortish medium primary projection. You know, that's probably on the shorter ends. I, I do see birds with slightly longer primary projections than that. The tail's sort of medium. It's a little bit longer than a Hammond's. But in general, a lot of the plumage is similar to a Hammond's. Um, it tends to be a rather dull, dingy bird. This one that Cinti's highlighting here is, you know, pretty dull, dingy all over. Um, that, uh, you know, not a lot of contrast on it, particularly on the wings as well. And then this is also a good one if it's in the spring to look at those range maps to just sort of check your date. 
Uh, again, a bird that doesn't show up until April and, and really in, in most of California is not showing up until after the first week of April or mid-April. Um, uh, you know, so where are, where are you and what is the time of year? I know in Los Angeles, it's very rare along the coastal slope, um, spring and fall. Uh, but in the spring, it's quite regular in the desert, so more of an inland uh, migrant and so I think you know it's always worth you, you, you know checking where you are and you know is it a bird you're likely to encounter or not um, and certainly if it trips an e-bird filter for you you know that might want to you know you may want to give yourself some pause of like what I did I did I record the call did I get some good enough photos to really confirm it because obviously it is super similar to to a Hammond's and then we've thrown least flycatcher in here as well. Now, for the average birdie, you shouldn't worry about this. This is more of a vagrant, but it does occur regularly enough that it can be a bit of a headache. Uh, you know, there have been some wintering vagrants up in, in your area, and we certainly have had them here down in Southern California, and, and they are quite difficult to identify, and that's me being conservative about it partly because they also have a wit call. So I think generally the confusion is between <clears throat> least and dusky. <laughs> dusky has a wit call as well. However, I would urge you to get your phone out and record it because the wits are different. Uh, least flycatcher has more energy. It's got this sort of strong harmonic, this sort of double banded line. They actually sound more similar um, and credit to Kimball Garrett, who's brought this up, is they sound more similar to uh, Audubon's warbler. Um, and in fact, you know, that is often the confusion is that you, you may think you've got an odd sounding Audubon's and then you get close and you realize it's a flycatcher. You may want to look a little more closely because it, it may well be a least, you know, a lot of energy in that call. Um, uh, and then in terms of plumage, you know, they're, they're quite similar. They're sort of like intermediate between Hammond's and dusky in terms of structure, in terms of the wing uh, projection and the tail projection, but in terms of plumage, much more contrast, a lot of contrast in those wings. See how contrasting those wing bars are with the rest of the wing and look how contrasting the wing bars are with the back. And then look how white the underparts are. Now, this is a classic looking least, beautiful looking bird. Many don't look this good. They look much more similar to dusky, but still, even those birds tend to be high contrast birds with a lot of contrast in the wing wing bars and wing panels. Um, and, and I think, again, with good photographs, structurally, I think you, you can be on the right path by just, you know, seeing, measuring. You don't need a ruler, but you can you can put a line up for where you think the primary projection is and where the tail is. And you can see that you've got a bird that's shorter tailed than you would expect for a dusky. Um, and that can certainly help with, with your ID. This is too much to digest in a webinar, but if you ever want to go through the book, take a little more time. This is, um, this is actually putting together Hammond's dusky least and looking at those um, structural differences between the primary projection and the tail length. Again, this is a generalization, um, but it is generally quite useful and has been useful in California, helping to separate some wintering lease. We have had um, a couple of wintering lease in Los Angeles County. I know there's been one also up in, in the Sacramento area a year or so ago where the tools on this place helped to ID the bird. Um, where, you know, least tends to be intermediate in terms of primary projection and tail length. And that coupled with, uh, you know, bill shape and plumage and general contrast has helped get to the right identification. Similarly, on the East Coast, there was a bird that people thought was a Hammond's for a while. And, um, you, you know, we were able to use the tools in this book to guide people into thinking, actually, it's probably more likely at least based on the sort of structure that we can see and they eventually were able to go out and get it to call and uh, you know sometimes it's quite easy to troll these birds and do some playback and they'll call and you know they can you, you can rest easy knowing what the id is um here's here's our western group dusky hammonds gray we should not um you know overemphasize how difficult this group can be particularly in the fall 
I've drawn them here so that they are all basically in identical plumage. And this is based on, you know, specimens and photos. They can look identical in plumage. Be very careful about any preconceived notions you may have about, well, it's got a gray head. It must be a Hammond's or, 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 or anything else. They can look identical. Structure can be super helpful. Again, like Cinti says, you know, you're not out in the field with a ruler. But a lot of us now have these point and shoot cameras. I have one. I'm not a photographer, but you can actually take reasonable enough photos of a quick moving MPID that you can look at them later, download them and, and go and draw these lines on it and see where does it fall? Does it look like it's falling more in the dusky, dusky group or the Hammonds group? Um, and structure can go a long way to helping you, you know, get to your get to your ID. Um, along with the uh, you know bill shape we have here, and and you can sort of see the long bill of a gray versus sort of the short bill of a Hammonds and and dusky. Again, these are generalizations. There can be overlap, but as you take all of these pieces together, you can come up with a with a with an ID. We think most of the time that should be correct. And then this this is just you know we we spent a long time over the last year looking at the wits, the wit call, because I think there was a lot of uh, feeling that you cannot separate them on the call. And you can see here how similar they are, but actually there are small differences. And, you know, I encourage people to record these birds. If a bird is calling, if you can record it on your phone, that is absolutely uh, critical. You can download it later. People can chime in. You can put it on Facebook, you can get feedback, you know, all of that stuff that um, is critical to the ID. As you can see, Hammond's is completely different shape. Dusky and gray are the most similar. Um, Dusky tends to have a slightly more curve to it. I sometimes refer to it as a bit more of a J shape to it, the letter J, um, compared to gray is more sort of straight. Um, and then you can see least, you know, has a strong, energetic, strong harmon harmonic that gives it more of an Audubon's warbler, harsh sort of sound. And Willow has this sort of inflection here. All of this can be can be seen if you're able to record it, even on your phone. You don't need good recording equipment. Just your your average phone will get you this. And. Is just some real life because I know when you look at illustrations, you think, well, what does it actually look like in real life? This is just an impression, but uh, um, again, just sort of, you know, here you can see that contrast, the bird on the left there, that you know, high contrast wings and wing wing bar contrast with the upper parts as well as on the wing itself, dusky in the middle with less contrast, Pacific slope over to the right also with not a lot of contrast. And was there actually? Do you want to go back? Was there the Brian's? I can't no. remember. What, yeah, was the one before that? Oh, this one. Yeah, I guess you know this is sort of the color summary. You can see those long. I almost don't really care about the plumage here. I'm looking at the shape of the bill and the head and that Hammonds and those long primaries and that short tail that also conveniently happens to be forked. And then I look over to the right on the dusky again, not pretend I can't see it well. I don't really know what the, the plumage looks like. But um, this primaries, you can see uh, maybe two thirds of the length of the Hammonds. They're not particularly short, but they are shorter. Um, it's hard to see much else in this picture in terms of the structure of the bill, et cetera. But I think on, on the on side profile, you'd see a slightly heftier bill. Um, and I think proportionately that tail is a little bit longer as well. You know, you see more tail projection because the wings are probably shorter um, as well, but it's also slightly longer tailed. And then obviously compared to this least here, which is like a classic high contrast bird with a medium-ish primary projection and a medium length tail. So Andy, can we identify these? Because I, I want to know if I'm right with my ID. Sure. We can do a poll. Even. Well, I know it's probably too long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to take a guess here, and and uh, maybe people can guess also. I don't know, but I was thinking that maybe that one. Um, well, 
the Pacific Slope looks like it's on the right, dusky in the middle. Yep, correct, yeah. Is that a least on the left? Yeah, yeah. There you go. You identified them with black and white photos. Well, I was paying attention <laughs> to what Cinti was saying about the uh, the contrast. It's so obvious in black and white. Without the yeah, it's, a little, it's a little more obvious. I mean, I think, you know, we'd always say with everything, it's not one feature. You've got to look at the whole bird and... You know, I'm sure there's high contrasty duskies occasionally out there, but in general, yeah, the the you know, it actually becomes a little easier to see when you take the color away. Um, you know, it becomes a little easier to see what you know since he's talking about there. But yes, you can see that sort of range there, <clears throat> and then structurally as well, you can sort of see the difference in bills, and you know, there, there's there's overlap in all this, but that's why there's so many features that you go through. And, and I think as Cynthia said at the beginning, it's like, it's okay if you don't really know if it's a medium or a short, just put both. Just say, I think it could be both. Mm -hmm. I don't really know if it's got a crisp eye ring or a teardrop eye ring. You know, you, you, know, you, can, you can put both, but you'll find as you go through all these, all these sorts of features, um, you, you know, you'll, you'll whittle it down to very few candidates um and 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 really i think you know what we should say with all of this and i sort of mentioned it is that photographs are, are really critical because i you know we get it trying to go through this list of features on a bird that's in front of you that's moving around is next to impossible but just a point and shoot camera you know with the autofocus you know sometimes you you can find you can get enough of a picture or two that would actually allow you to study it more closely at home and i, I highly highly recommend that and then, you know, the other tool that we bring with us everywhere is our phones, which can do pretty decent recordings. And that could also be enough to give you a diagnostic um, ID. And this, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's a wrap on. Oh, fan fantastic. Uh, I, um, I, I know we're going to have some questions coming in on chat. Um, I have a couple of my own, maybe to give people a, a chance to think about questions they may have. And, and I'm wondering if maybe Barry can help monitor incoming questions. But uh, here's a simple one. Uh, is, is, there, is there any truth to the uh, story I heard from David Gaines about um, when Teddy Roosevelt met John Muir in Yosemite? One of the questions he asked when they were uh, at Glacier Point was how do you tell Hammonds from Dusky Flycatcher? <laughs> is, that, is there any truth to that? Because I've been telling that story to my classes for years. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. I hope it's true. Do I hope it's yeah. true also. I think David Gaines is pretty trustworthy, but oh know, yeah, he was a good birder. Uh, yes, absolutely. But if you haven't heard it, then maybe maybe it's just uh, apocryphal. I I don't know, but it sure is funny to think about. <laughs> Uh, Teddy Roosevelt wondering about those two right. difficult fly catchers <laughs> and how you tell them apart. Um, so uh, I have a I have another a couple of quick questions. Um, I've noticed in Andy's artwork and a lot of the photographs that were featured in Cinti's um, portion of the show, uh, lores. Are are you finding that? I mean, if you exclude the peewees. Are lures, the brightness of the lures, helpful in identifying the Impidinax flycatchers at all? Because sometimes they really almost look like uh, Casson's Vireo with the color, with the spectacle type facial pattern. And in other times, the lures seem to be fairly dark. Even the picture we're looking at right now, your artwork, the lures on the, uh, was it the alder flycatcher on the left? Mm -hmm. um, seem to be a little duller than the Acadian on the right. Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Andy. No, I mean, I was going to say, I don't, I don't, I don't know that they're useful for separating between species, but I, I certainly think they can be useful for knowing you've got a flycatcher, I suppose. Mm -hmm. you? Yes, you know, I guess in some uh, previous literature, they do emphasize lures, like uh, dusky flycatcher has pale lures, but if you go through our book, you'll notice that we, we really don't talk a lot about the lures. Mm -hmm. uh, largely because I mean almost all of them can have pale lures mm -hmm. and it's so variable so I don't know about Andy but it's never been very useful for me I mean certainly separating kiwis from the impids it, it helps but there are many other features that separate that so we don't we don't actually have a lore 
parts uh, in that front parts of the book. Interesting. Yeah, um, I just have noticed it sometimes on the higher contrast eastern warblers, it, uh, eastern uh, flycatchers. It seems like perhaps the lures are a little bit more bright, but it could just be the time of year that those photographs are taken. I'm not sure. I mean, you, you could be seeing it on the eastern, you know, I mean, in general, as Cindy said, they tend to be higher contrast birds. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, you, you could be seeing that some of those eastern species look like they have more contrasting laws, you know, because in general, they're a more contrasty looking bird, that's for sure. Um, I just don't know that it's helpful separating between the species, that's all. Right. But, you know, certainly it could be a clue. You come across in the fall some vagrant alder and you may be drawn attention to the high contrast wings and the underparts and the laws, you know, may all stand out significantly compared to all the, the, the Western flycatchers you've been seeing, you know. Sure, sure. Well, uh, it might just demonstrate that you're seeing something different, uh, if nothing else. Right. Yeah. Right. So I really appreciate the um, your emphasis, uh, both of your uh, both of your contributions to the discussion here. Emphasis on structure. I mean, I always have relied on structure with gulls and warblers and flycatchers, and it's so useful. And and yet, I think field guides tend not to. Uh, emphasize it enough. So I'm so happy to see not only the emphasis on structure here, but you've provided us, both of you have provided us with so many more variables to look at. Um, for me personally, uh, examining the wing panel was something I hadn't really put much thought to before, but I'm finding now as I as I look at Pacific Slope and Hammond's flycatchers this week, you know, I'm seeing that difference. And I wasn't really noticing it before, and, and likewise the contrast of upper parts and lower parts, or um, or the the wing, the brightness of the wing bars. It's it's so eye opening to have this new vocabulary, these new features to look for, because you're always scrambling for whatever you can get on a moving flycatcher, uh, and to have that is is pretty wonderful. Well, my last question is before we start looking at the the questions from the audience, is. Um, you two have worked together for so long on so many wonderful projects, and the only one I don't think I've read is the Orioles one. I'd love it if you could send me a link to it, um, but I've, I've read all the others. What's it like to assemble an in-depth field guide like this, and where do you start? I mean, you, at the beginning of your book, you included all the, the variables, that I, as I called them, and the how to look at the bird, but is that how you begin? Where do you start uh, to produce a book like this with the workflow that you've developed over the years, uh, that partnership that has been so successful? How do you start? Gosh, I don't know, Andy, if, <laughs> if you want to answer that. I, I, I guess somehow just Andy and I work well together. We're on the same wavelength. I mean, uh, you know, of course, I also do illustrations, but Andy is orders and magnitude better than me. But I think being able to do illustrations uh, helps me also kind of appreciate. I think sketching birds in general helps you really appreciate these uh, structural features, subtle features, and I think maybe that helps me relate with uh, to Andy. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, we seem to work well together, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I mean, we. It was sort of born out of the lockdown, this particular book, well, I'm born, it was, it'd been born for years earlier, but it, the, the actual sort of knuckle down and get on with it happened during the lockdown. And, um, you know, as, as I think we've heard a lot of bird books are now coming out that were, that were written during the lockdown. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, the, we all actually, I think we're forced to figure out ways to become more connected uh e even more than we were before and i feel like you know working on this book was even easier than some of the other projects i think um it, you know there's been tremendous advancements uh, you know we, we now have access to thousands of photos at our fingertips on places like ebird and iNaturalist um Cynthia and i can discuss stuff easily send things back and forth through you know dropbox google drive and and you know we would do zooms together and 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 share material back and forth and and the technology is has made it i think a lot easier to make a book like this you know cinti hinted at like trying to do those maps 10 years ago or 20 years ago would have been 
you know, impossible. And, and we now have access to citizen science data, which includes the, the sightings that everybody, people on this talk here included, as well as the photos that everyone submits, which is invaluable to, to people like me who are trying to illustrate this stuff, is trying to find a generic look or generic looks and, and having the access to thousands of photos is, is, is amazing. So yeah, I, I do think absolutely we benefited from the technology and we, we we have a good partnership now because of the technology i i so love it personally love the uh, multiple species feature on the uh, image search in um in in uh, ebird so you can you can kind of test yourself on species when they're photographed together and it doesn't tell you which one is which so that's really fun i'm also really so pleased that you relied on ebird for the maps this is what we did for our checklist as well um, and it's uh, it's uh, amazing um, how how rich that data is. We're just so happy to to have it. Cinti, you were about to say something. Yeah, I was going to add one thing that I think um, we couldn't have done this 20 years ago. And uh, all the other things that Andy and I did together, um, I don't know if you know the illustration is there or or the. I mean, painting, gouache, and uh, all of these that Andy did are digital. All of the uh, maps that I did are on GIS. And so with something like flycatchers, where getting it right is actually so difficult. And imagine if, you know, Andy had uh, painted the, the traditional style and then we find there's a mistake. Oh, my God. You know, I'm going back and forth. So with the digital painting, and Andy can add to that, of course, uh, you know, we could go back and forth so fast if something had to be changed. Um, so the digital approach was was great. Even the layout of the book, we um, we m most of that layout was something that we kind of designed and gave it to Princeton. I mean, we were really terrified of like saying them individual plates that they would mix them all up. So we we had to design everything ourselves. Uh, there were still a few mistakes, but wow, um, that's, inc but, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, the layout was all us. I, I'm really fascinated to hear that, uh, Andy, the illustrations were done uh, digitally. That's I can easily see how that would make edits possible. I mean, they would yeah. be impossible if you've been painting everything with gouache or watercolor. And Cinti, yes, I'm familiar with your paintings, uh, fantastic illustrations, and I've admired them for a long time. Um, so thanks for mentioning that. Um, I wonder, Barry, uh, have you found any questions in chat that we need to ask these two guys? Uh, yeah, we do have a few questions I wanted to pass along. Uh, one of them was, uh, you had mentioned the great flycatcher and its tail bobbing. Does the Pacific Slope also bob its tail? I mean, they, they all, all of them sort of flick, they all have a nervous energy. Mm -hmm. So, um, Yes, you, you could see all of them flick tails and flick wings. Um, and yes, Pacific Slope will sort of flick its tail uh, quite a bit. Um, gray Flycatcher has a more deliberate tail dip um, that's a little bit different from the others. Okay. Um, you know, uh, they say they were in uh, Bid or Pardon. I don't know, I was looking at Dusky or Hammond's. Um, you know, I'm guessing by date, it's probably more likely to be a Hammonds, I, I'm assuming. I'm a little less familiar with the, the, the status. Well, distribution we, get, we get dusky and, and gray occasionally in spring, but I think more often in fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, generally the Pacific slopes you see right now are quite colorful looking you know the few i saw today are all quite green and yellow when you see them in good light uh, whereas you know hammond's is is pretty dull dull bird mm -hmm. uh, so i don't know we may not have helped you with your question <laughs> they all <laughs> think the yeah, tails I, 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 <laughs> different character to the tail bobbing i guess is a, is yeah. a good answer um somebody wanted to know if flycatchers live in other parts of the world besides north america well they're the, the most of them are down in the, the tropics in South America and Central America, and only a small fraction actually uh, migrate up to uh, North America. But they, they're not, they're really a new world species. We mm -hmm. have flycatchers in the old world, but they're a fundamentally different uh, group of birds. Sure. Are there, are there ampids in Southern South America? 
in southern well the, oh just in South America are the empids are all north and central or are the em empid uh, well, the empids are primarily uh, North America Central America okay. so we if we try to get all of the empids it would not not be <laughs> that bad I guess. <laughs> we we have a couple down in Central America that we haven't done because they haven't made it up to the U.S. yet, but they get close. White throated flycatcher. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, uh, where can people find your book? You, there are a lot of great comments about your book and how much how, how much they were liking it. Um, where where can where can people buy it? I think uh, anywhere Amazon's got it, and I think I just last looked. I, I think it's like a couple of dollars off now. Uh, <laughs> I think Boutio, Boutio books, if you've seen you know, I think portions of sales of Boutio books go to the ABA. Mm -hmm. I don't right. know if, uh, if your Audubon Society has a link on an Amazon store. Obviously, if you buy there, you get a, you get a percentage goes to your local Audubon. I don't know. Do you have, and I think there's a I'll discount an right now on Princeton. So okay. yeah. I got okay. for all for all books actually. Uh, and one last question: What would you recommend for recording the sound on? On you said a phone works really great, but should people use like Merlin or iNaturalist or some other uh, recording app? Um, I I use personally I use uh, Merlin from time to time because mm -hmm. it saves the recording. You know, it'll also try and identify the bird. <laughs> which I think you sort of have to take that with a pinch of salt. You, you got to be careful sometimes. I was yeah, curious I, how accurate is Merlin with the MPs. Yeah, I mean the visual ID I feel on this on these AI apps is absolutely amazing. I think mm -hmm. the sound still has a long way to go, but even then on the visuals, I would be careful about putting your photos in and just taking it as gospel. There's still yeah. Mm -hmm. because, okay. It's the same with goals are still a little bit shaky in that area, but the AI is amazing. But, um, you know, uh, yeah, Merlin has, you can record there and it may attempt an ID for you. I, it may not. Um, and then I also have something on my phone. Um, you know, I just have, a, also have an app, a free app that I downloaded a recording, uh, app that records at a high bit rate as well. I can't remember the name of that, but you know, there's plenty of those in the app store. You can get a useful recording from just the the voice voice recorder on which comes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I that works well. But I like to I like to use um, Merlin as well because you do see the uh, spectrum yeah. the sonogram right in front of you as it's moving and it does record it. It does save yeah. it. So that seems like a good reason to use it, and it's free. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You just have to be careful that uh, uh, there was one situation out here in Texas where someone recorded a pip. And uh, it turns out it was a Carolina wren pit, uh, but it was identified as a Hammond. So, oh. by Merlin. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. It does happen. And then, and then uh, when, you know, you get vagrant birds, and you have like twenty people out there and recording, but then somebody's out there playing the tape, um, <laughs> different types of species, and it's a huge <laughs> mess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, Barry, I think that's is that the end of the questions. I think that's it for questions. I just wanted to echo one of the comments in the in the uh, chat, which was those seasonal maps are really cool, and the extra notation that you've done on them is not something I'd seen in uh, field guides before, and I really like that. I think that's going to be really helpful. Yeah, we have the advantage in this book of space. So the average field guides are trying to get a thousand species, and you know we have a lot of space here because it's dedicated to a few species. So yeah, those maps are are very large and you know we deliberately made the font large <laughs> everything big because we got a lot of good for you yeah, I yeah, like it back the things were too small in the average field guide so the font is big the illustrations are big the maps are big um we try to that was for us because we couldn't even read the field guide so we made them big for our eyes <laughs> for our, our eyes. aging yeah. eyes I, you know, I appreciate you could actually even go a little bit bigger you know <laughs> just saying yeah, yeah. yeah i think so uh, so this this book is truly a triumph and i'm i'm so glad to have you both here to talk about this fabulous work and i for one am absolutely thrilled that this is part one of a multi-part series and i just cannot wait for the follow-ups so um as soon as they're available i'm gonna order one um but thank you so much for being here tonight 
and uh, sharing your knowledge and the beautiful artwork and the fabulous writing and analysis of all the species um, for this complicated group of birds. And I, I know it's going to be useful to everybody here. And uh, we, this uh, session has been recorded and we'll post it most likely tomorrow um, so that the rest of the members can see it and you could watch it again if you'd like. But thank you again so much for being here. Uh, such a pleasure to have you and best of luck in any future projects. So take care and thank you so thank much. You thank, thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Good night. See you all later. Thanks.